Thanks for joining me, your host, Pastor Chris Morgan, for today's current events in the world we are living in. I'm calling this episode The Communist Road Part 1. Is America being led to a communist takeover? Before you say no, please consider taking the next 20 minutes to watch and learn. But if it was, how would we know since most of us have never lived in a communist nation? What would a takeover actually look like? And what steps would have to be taken? What would leaders have to do? Today, many of Americans are oblivious to what's really happening in our nation, and others would even deny that many of its leaders who are sworn to defend our nation are doing much to this nation's own demise. But the evidence is overwhelming that this nation is under a communist attack, and unless its citizens wake up to what's being done to it, it could be too late, but it doesn't have to be. Now, thanks to filmmakers, Mickey Willis and his own personal journey, the questions I previously asked can be answered about the communist road. As the world descended into synchronized tyranny, I began to ask myself, how did they get everyone to go along with this? Oh, it feels so good. I know. Obsessed with finding the answer. I began studying every moment in recorded history where masses of people devolved into a state of self-destruction. Down that rabbit hole was where I discovered the work of G. Edward Griffin. And gentlemen, again let me say welcome to our home. Since the 1960s, Mr. Griffin has been warning the world of the communist plot to overtake America. Yes, I know, communism. Everyone's talking about the necessity for change right now, particularly here in the U.S. Over the past few months, as a filmmaker, I've had the honor of documenting the political revolution. That was me in 2016, the year of my political awakening. Come on board the political revolution! I was touring with the Bernie Sanders campaign, creating media to help his grassroots movement grow. At that time, I knew very little about socialism and even less about democratic socialism. As it turned out, I wasn't the only one. So my Bernie bros, how do we redistribute wealth through taxation without expanding the powers of the federal government? Bernie Sanders! As confusion set in, I began turning my questions inward. Are they hypnotized? Am I hypnotized? That question, that one simple question, activated some strange sort of faith healing. Suddenly, I could see. How did I not see this before? There were so many red flags. I'm well aware that whether you're here in person or through the medium of motion picture, that for most of you, it's not easy to fit meetings of this kind into your schedules. But the fact that you are here indicates that you do have an interest in the subject. So in order not to waste any of your time, let's dispense with the usual preliminaries and get right down to the business at hand. We're going to examine in quite a bit of detail the communist theory and practice of revolution particularly as applied to the United States. Now, this will not be something dreamed up out of thin air. This will be the strategy as taught by them and advocated by them in their own manuals, in their textbooks, and in their schools. The uh, new program of the Communist Party on this subject has this to say. The term socialism describes but the first stage of a new society that in its full development is called communism. Socialism is a transitional stage. Now the People's World, the official West Coast newspaper of the Communist Party, 
ran this rather interesting editorial. What is needed now is an effort that begins to approximate the magnitude of the problem. As a minimum, such a program should demand massive emergency action by the federal government. Rules provided by the COVID-19 emergency, many other elected leaders were empowered to show their true colors. Interesting how they all marched in perfect lockstep while chanting the same slogans. This pandemic has provided an opportunity. Here we are now with an economy in crisis, but with an incredible opportunity. It's certainly a major crisis, but it also offers us a unique opportunity. Unprecedented opportunity to rethink and reset. The great opportunity for reset. Opportunity for us to reset. For a reset. It's almost as if they all attended the same school of thought and studied under the same professor. Some people would say this revolution is characterized by the fight of robots against human beings. And we will win this fight. Professor Klaus Schwab was born in 1938 in Ravensburg, Germany, where Nazi crimes against humanity were committed. His father, Eugene Wilhelm Schwab, was the managing director of Escher Weiss Ravensburg a company that used slave labor to manufacture weapons of war for the Third Reich. While Klaus's father was at the helm, the Nazi party awarded Escher Weiss Ravensburg the title of National Socialist Model Company. Years later, Klaus Schwab joined the board of directors at Escher Weiss Ravensburg, where he played a key role in the development of South Africa's nuclear weapons program during the darkest years of the racist apartheid regime. Today, Klaus Schwab is the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. If you'd like to meet the people who are supposed to repair the state of the world, or give a piece of your mind to the bankers who help get us into this mess, we can tell you where to find a lot of them. The World Economic Forum. Founded in 1971, the World Economic Forum is an international private organization which receives billions of tax-free dollars from its members and their global enterprises. Every year, the WEF brings together its members with world leaders, big pharma executives, tech titans, Hollywood celebrities, media personalities, and Internet influencers to meet in the secluded mountains of Davos, Switzerland. It is a tiny town folded into the Swiss Alps, a village where you could bump into Bill Clinton, Bill Gates, the head of Google, and the Queen of Jordan, all in one place. A lot of reporters cover the forum, but few get inside. It turns out there are two Davoses, one you see and one you don't. After hours, there are hundreds of private parties where deals are done. People who can't be seen together in public can meet here. Your Royal Highnesses, Excellencies, distinguished heads of state and government, the future is built by us, by a powerful community as you here in this room. Klaus Schwab, the founder of the WEF, is particularly upfront and even proud of his ability to shape and influence world politics. I created the community of global shapers as a means, as a force to shape our common future. And of course, their Global Young Leaders program is a grooming ground so that when they ultimately infiltrate cabinets, we penetrate the cabinets, they will likely tend to govern a certain way. Nobody will be safe if not everybody is vaccinated. The names in the countries he mentioned ended up being some of the most dystopian and authoritative during this pandemic. Names like this Merkel, uh, Vladimir Putin, and so on. Other names? Jacinda Ardern, Sebastian Kurz, Mauricio McCree, Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Ma, Gavin Newsom, Stephane Bancel, Chelsea Clinton, Leonardo DiCaprio, Sanjay Gupta, Dr. Leanna Wen, Alexander and Jonathan Soros, George Soros' sons, and several of the Rothschilds. And, of course... Now, who could represent such a world better than you, Prime Minister? In 2014, Klaus Schwab called for the Great Reset. We need a Great Reset. Which he positioned as the solution to the world's most urgent issues. 
The dark reality of Schwab's agenda is detailed in his best-selling book, COVID-19, The Great Reset. His endgame mission is to replace independent governance with a top-down controlled, one-world government and a central bank-controlled digital currency. When they say, you'll be happy, what they mean is, you'll be enslaved. That's why they're talking about a Great Reset. That's why they're talking about introducing this quasi-communist, quasi-socialist agenda. They know we've run the course where we cannot continue down the path of the ever-increasing indebtedness because we have a generation that quite literally cannot afford to buy a house. Millions of Americans are priced out of buying a home. And so it's easy to tell that generation we're going to forgive your college debt, student debt relief, and set your expectations lower. You're going to rent forever. We're going to celebrate the tiny house movement. We're going to do all of these things which sound cool because they're shaping our narrative so that we become capable of expecting less. What we need to do is not expect less. We need to remove inefficiencies so we can experience more. And that's the subtle distinction that the Great Reset is missing. Like most globalists, Schwab regards communist China as a shining model of how he intends to transform the world. We now welcome His Excellency Xi Jinping. China has made significant economic and social achievements under your leadership. Chinese influence on global affairs is growing. The founder of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, says that this is what motivated the group this year to invite President Xi Jinping to deliver the keynote address in Davos. Schwab said Xi's presence was a sign of the shift from a unipolar world dominated by the United States to a more multipolar system in which rising powers like China will have a step up and play a bigger role. I think it's um, a role model for many countries. But um, we have to go one step further. It's a systemic transformation of the world. Artificial intelligence, the metaverse, synthetic biology. Our life in 10 years from now will be completely different. And who masters those technologies will be the master of the world. I was born in communist China two years before Mao started his uh, cultural revolution. So we had to be indoctrinated and uh, chanting slogans and holding Chairman Mao's little red books to say long live Chairman Mao, long live Communist Party. Inspired by Soviet Union dictators, Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin, China's communist leader, Mao Zedong, borrowed from the playbook of the Russian Revolution. To fight anti-communist forces, Lenin organized a military branch of his communist party, known as the Red Army. Following suit, Mao branded his army the Red Guards. However, Mao's soldiers were not enlisted from his military. His Red Guards were made up of high school and university students. So he used young people to start cultural revolution, to top down statues, burning old buildings, and demonize all religions, going after all dissident voices, and to turn all the Chinese against each other, family turn on each other, neighbors turn on each other. Chairman Mao, as he was known, was deeply influenced by Lenin's ideas on Marxism and revolution, and often praised Stalin as a great leader. He started his Great Leap Forward campaign in the 50s and killed 2 million landlord owners. 40 million to 60 million people estimated starving to death. The people were treating their children's dead bodies to eat, to survive. Cannibalism was everywhere. Through war, torture, execution and famine, Chairman Mao caused the death of 80 million innocent people, making him the deadliest dictator of all time. China shaved the heads of women.
maybe it's because I came in the movement at 17 and a half, so I have like just a knack for knowing how to organize young people. I was at the, our publication table today, and I was speaking to this young person, and he grabbed a book, and he said, it's like Mal's Red Book. And I was like, man, that's what I was thinking. And it was just really cool to hear him make that connection. I was like, how about you buy like 10 to 15 of these books, and you all have like a youth organizing group where you talk about it, and you really try to engage this. We need to build off of this. The young people are used today to do the American Cultural Revolution to turn the kids basically not to trust their parents anymore and to say, oh, my parents don't understand me, I'm confused, I need to turn to my teachers, turn to other authority figures. Look at the Mao's Cultural Revolution to see how many similarities are there. What was happening in the USSR no, between 1917? We make a critique of it. That's what we're Maoists. We make a critique of it in order to improve socialism. The next time it comes around and throws people like you into a labor camp. Yesterday, I asked Chat GPT, "Are there any similarities between today's woke revolution and Chairman Mao's cultural revolution of the 1960s?" And it wrote back, "How long do you have?" You know, I believe that you really care about this nation. And if this has helped inform you and open your eyes, I ask you to please join me next week for part two of The Communist Road. I want to leave you with this thought. Two enemies to our nation and its republic are fear and what's called mass formation. Both are psychological weapons used against the masses to get them to conform to a particular narrative and ideologies which will always lead to ultimate control. Our greatest weapon, however, is truth and faith, both of which originate in God and His Word. Jesus Himself said in John chapter 8, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Remember all also, Romans 12, 21 tells us not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. And I want us to know that we can win over the evils of communism because the gospel is the power of God still releasing the earth today to bring people to Christ and bring down the strongholds of the enemy. I want you to please consider sharing this with others and be sure to check out part two next week. Until then, I'm your host, Pastor Chris Morgan. I'll call you blessed.